Justified Means The Agency Files, Book One Written by Shatona Havig Narrated by Krista Del Sorbo 26. What are you looking for? Anything that looks out of place, no matter how small. Keith hardly paused to answer as his hand scribbled another note onto the large legal pad. Are those the normal things or the anomalies? Anomalies. His forehead furrowed and his jaw set rigidly as he added another item. Erica read the line and frowned. The fact that I asked to talk to Mark is an anomaly? Yep. Most people never do. Not even in exasperation. I know it means nothing to you, but I have to add it in case it triggered something in someone else. Mark. The name dropped from her lips like an anvil on stone. Well, not just him, no, but it is another mark against him. Erica grinned. Cute. Looking up from his files, Keith shook his head. What? A mark against Mark. I just thought it was kind of funny. There it was again, the terseness. It was back. She anticipated the tone of his response before he opened his mouth. Yeah, do you need something? I need you to note that you've gotten grumpy again. This is the tenth time since you challenged me to note them. Well, it's duly noted. Erica glanced at Karen as if to say, See, it's not in my head. Karen's face just registered complete shock. When she said that it was out of character for him, she must have meant it. Before Erica could ask another question, Keith whirled in his chair, seeking Karen. Hey, this doesn't say. When did Helen contact us? I need everything from the first call through the night we took Erica. Can you get that? I could just drive to the office. Mark wouldn't know if it had been a few days' drive or a few minutes. If you did that, you couldn't come back here. The risk. Yeah, I was thinking about taking Claire, too, but that'd leave you guys unprotected. Why Claire? Keith glanced toward the room where his cousin generally lay on the bed curled in a fetal position, waiting for the nightmare to end. She has knowledge of Anastasis' organization. She might see something that we don't. Take her. Just don't bring her back. You'll have to be vigilant, but maybe you can lose a tail. He flipped the pad to a new page, scribbled some directions, and pulled a key from his pocket. I managed to find Uncle Ted's spare key in the RV. Take her there if you manage to escape scrutiny. Otherwise, don't risk it. Are you sure? Karen glanced at Erica, who listened to the entire conversation with great interest. We need a break. Fast. Every day that passes is a day these girls can't get back. Every day that passes gets the mole more information. We've got to stop this. Are you okay with that, Erica? Sure. I've put up with this grouch before. I'm not a grouch. Both women snickered at the growl in his voice. Keith glanced up. What? Let's just say your voice belies your words. Belies? Erica smirked and crossed her arms. You know, makes a liar out of you. Since when does Karen use words like belies? Since you stuck her in a house with nothing but books from the 19th century. Karen tossed a mock leather-bound copy of The Count of Monte Cristo onto the table, jarring Keith's pen. Whatever. Just get going. Don't change your clothes and rub the back of your hair on the headrest all the way there. Make sure you smooth your clothes as you get out of the car. I know how to do this stuff, Keith. It's not like I'm a trainee. Karen's voice trailed off as she wandered down the hall to give Claire the good news. Adventure awaited them in Rockland. From her perch on the futon that was just as uncomfortable during the day as she was sure it was at night, Erica ignored her book in favor of watching Keith as he scribbled line after line of things that probably meant nothing. As the silence settled around him, she watched his features relax. It was hard to tell just what he was thinking. Unlike most people, his face gave away nothing. Claire burst from her room, her duffel swinging over one shoulder, her purse in hand. We're going! I actually get to do something. I'm so excited. This is what I thought this job would be like, not sitting around here waiting to get our heads blown off if we glance out the wrong window. Keith's grin was infectious. He jumped up, hugged his cousin, and glanced over her head at Karen. 
Take care, both of you. Neither of you is expendable. With a glance at Erica, Karen grabbed Keith's pen from him, flipped the page up, and scribbled a note on it. Keith glanced toward Erica before looking at Karen. What? Just don't forget. Keith pulled the sheet from the pad, crumbled it, and tossed it at the trash can next to the garage door. It missed. He started to rise to toss it properly, but Karen shoved his shoulder back down. I'll get it. Take care, you guys. Don't get lazy. Once the two women were gone, Keith slowly immersed himself in his work again, but the absent-mindedness was gone. This Keith was driven, focused, and yet attuned to everything around him. A dog barked outside, and he shifted. A kid cried, and he jumped up, peeking out the curtain to make sure it was something he could continue to ignore. The work went slower, but Erica saw a new determination in him. It was almost as if now that he was without backup, he was even more determined to get her out of there. He doesn't like me. I annoy him, she thought as she watched the process. I wonder why. Just as she was ready to go take a shower, Keith glanced up at her. I've almost finished this. I want you to think of everything that happened from the minute you stepped into the airport until we came back for you. Everything. Think about who you worked with, who you talked to at work, who called your cell phone, your house phone, everything. Minutes later, he rose, shut the laptop, and ambled down the hall to the bathroom. The second the door shut, she jumped and raced across the kitchen. Unfolding the wadded yellow paper, she read Karen's words. Be nice to her. You're like a different person around her, and it's making it hard for her. Be nice. It still made no sense. From that first day, he'd been stern, almost fierce at times. She could tell he had a sense of humor, but he never relaxed enough around her to show it. The only time he'd been nice was at the trailer and until Karen had joined them. Then, immediately it was as if a weight lifted for about 24 hours. He'd be even less relaxed now that he was solely responsible for her safety. She dashed back to the futon and made sure she was dragging herself off it as he returned. I'm going to take a shower and then I'll give you a rundown of everything I can think of, okay? Sure, I'm going to make a sandwich. Want one? There it was again, that infernal politeness that she knew was genuine, but it had none of the warmth behind it that he showed Karen and Claire. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. You could have asked what was in the note. I'd have told you. Busted. Keith felt immense satisfaction at the guilty look on Erica's face. It had been a guess, an intuitive one perhaps, but a guess nevertheless. However, Karen's admonitions lately had put him on edge. Erica hadn't seemed to complain about him until after one of Karen's visits. Apparently, she'd commented about some sort of difference she'd noticed. Whatever it was, he needed to be on his guard. He had no excuse for making Erica's stay any more difficult than it already was. The girl had to be ready to scream with frustration. As the water came on in the bathroom, he pulled out the lunch meat, bread, Lettuce, tomato, and mayo. They'd run out of mustard packets days ago. He liked mustard, but there was nothing he could do about it. As he worked, he considered the different cases he'd worked over the years. Erica really was a good sport. She didn't freak, even when she wanted to. The difference in his expectations now compared to the last time he'd guarded her glared acutely. He'd been determined to keep her fighting, wanting her to push the envelope to stay antagonistic toward him. She'd needed that then, but although she was still an abducted client, she worked with them to keep her safe. The stress level alone was different. Terse, stern, scowl. Those words made no sense. He'd never been what you'd call jolly, but Keith was a pleasant guy. No one had ever considered him anything but friendly and companionable. It seemed strange that anyone would say something like that about him, but even Karen had seen it. It wasn't just Erica's imagination. Before Keith could work through the accusation, Erica came out of the bathroom, towel drying her hair as she did. Man, I love a good hot shower. Me too. Your sandwich is there. 
He pointed to a plate with the butter knife before digging it into the mayonnaise jar. Erica stepped into the garage and tossed the towel into the dryer. She'd set it for five minutes on the highest heat. She did it every time. It was brilliant. She used the same towel every time she showered and hadn't washed it yet. Keith had been tempted to sniff it to see if it had gone sour, but the idea seemed a bit creepy, stalkerish in a not-stalking sort of way. Okay, so what do you need to know? Her voice jerked him from his mildewing musings. Oh, well, why don't you try to tell me everyone you talk to, everyone you can think of since you've been home, the mail you opened, the messages on machines, where you went after or before work, anything— well, I called my friend Yvonne from the airport. I knew she'd be ticked off that I hadn't invited her on my trip. And was she? No. She thought I went with Brent and didn't want to admit it or something. Brent? Keith assumed it was the man in the photos but waited for confirmation. A guy I met. Yvonne wouldn't think twice about taking off for two weeks with a guy she hardly knows. I figure it's a recipe for disaster— can you imagine how miserable you'd be if you found out you hated him? Yeah. Keith took a swig of his tea and then grinned. It's much better to be chained up in a cabin in the middle of nowhere with a stranger. Safer, anyway. Her smile seemed odd at a time like that. Who smiles at the memory of being shackled and locked in a room for your own good? I was really ticked at you. I know. I was glad. I still don't get that. She chewed slowly, thoughtfully. How did someone do that? Keith didn't understand her. It sounds weirder than it is. The angrier you are, the more you're likely to fight. You need to fight. The minute captivity seems like a reasonable norm, you're already becoming a victim. It's best if you fight. Well, technically, she argued, grabbing a handful of raisins from a box on the counter and sprinkling them over her sandwich. The idea made him shudder. I was a victim. I was kidnapped. What else do you call me but the victim of a kidnapping? Her air quotes would have been cute if he hadn't seen a raisin peeking out from a bite of her turkey and provolone. How can you eat that? It's good. Try it. Erica offered her sandwich, but Keith recoiled as if she offered him snake innards. I'll stick to my plain, mustardless sandwich. What does mustard have to do with anything? Keith shrugged. I just like mustard and we're out of packets. I've got some at home. I could run over after dark. Not on your life. He polished off his last bite of sandwich, dusted his hands over his plate, and shoved it to the side. So, what next? Erica told about her first day back at work, about talking to missed customers, about the online class she considered taking the research internship she'd considered, and the guy who tried to pick her up in the produce department. He was a creep and a half. Too bad. Why too bad? He was great looking. Everything I like in a guy. But man, you could tell he'd heard that you pick up women in the produce department. So he stood around almost like a vulture, just waiting for someone he didn't consider revolting to arrive. You're kidding. No, Erica snickered. I watched him for a bit while I was picking over the asparagus. Then I decided I had to have a bell pepper. The familiar furrows formed on Keith's forehead. He knew they were there and could almost hear his mother's warning that he'd have premature wrinkles due to the habit. Why bell pepper? Because he was standing next to them. I had to see if I passed muster. Well, that's ridiculous. Of course you did. Well, listening from this end, sure— you know he tried to pick me up, so of course I did. But from where I stood, the guy was pretty picky. I almost wonder if he wasn't getting desperate. Fishing for compliments? Huh? She blinked, obviously trying to make the connection. Well, you acted like maybe you were his desperate move, so I wondered if that was my cue to tell you that you're not desperation material or something. Nah, we both know I'm not your type. I don't think I was his type either. That's why I thought maybe he was desperate. He'd been eyeing blondes. So, what made you decide he was creepy? He asked if I wanted to go out for coffee, and then mentioned the shop. It just felt weird, you know? I mean, it was just one of those odd coincidences, and I wouldn't have thought anything of it. But when I said no, 
He got really pushy. I hate that. He knew he'd gone tense but couldn't prevent it. Pushy how? Oh, you know how jerks like that are. You say no, they say how come. You say you're not interested, they say just one cup. Most guys won't try past three, but this guy wouldn't stop until I walked away. See? Desperate. Do you remember what he looked like? Oh, yeah. Keith didn't like the way she said that, but even more, he hated the fact that he didn't like it. What kind of nonsense was that? Erica was a client, not a Christian, and most definitely not his type. Therefore, he was likely pulling a reverse Stockholm Syndrome type thing where he felt loyal to her. Great. Ugh. Well? She shrugged. Well, what? What did he look like? Unexpectedly, she stood, pulling him from the bar stool. Yeah, about your height, give or take an inch. Build, too. His hair was darker and his nose was more prominent. I think his jaw was more angular somehow, but really, he looked a lot like you. That's how I noticed him in the first place. I was sure you were going to take me back, and I was ready to run. Sorry. What for? I didn't give you the option of running. Taking her plate to the sink, Erica rinsed it and then turned, leaning against the counter. You did the right thing. No, I don't like it any better than I did, but I appreciate it. It's frustrating, nerve-wracking, and a little scary, but it's nice, too. I feel safe. Okay, what else? Keith made a note to see if the store had any kind of surveillance tapes they could procure. I'm telling you, I had a boring week. I went out to the pizza zone, read a book, surfed the internet, talked to Helen about her renovation scheme... Helen, the owner of your house? Yeah. I thought she lived in Australia this time of year. Erica nodded. She does, but she wants to do renovations and had questions for me. I guess she even considered coming back early this year, but work won't let her. What does she do? International trade. I don't really understand what all it is, but I think she makes pretty good money. But? Keith objected, trying to respond as natural as possible. No offense or anything, but your house is just a decent suburban-type house. It's not all that big. The furniture is nice, but it's not expensive, and you don't even have granite. He forced himself to sound excessively indignant, hoping to sound like he was teasing. Perhaps that's the point of the renovation. After several seconds rummaging through the cupboards for the prepackaged chocolate chip cookies, Erica added, Besides... It has to be expensive to keep two houses in two countries. Maybe she's just frugal. Or trying to keep a low profile, he thought. What day was that? I think about three or four days before you came back for me. Morning bells flashed like beacons in Keith's mind, while Erica rambled on about something to do with the pool cover and dinner at her parents' house. He did the mental math from the time he dropped her off at the airport when Helen had gone back to Australia, and when Mike would have gotten the call to go after them. Unaware that she'd stopped talking, he grabbed the notepad and pen from the table and backtracked, flipping through several things, pausing, taking notes, and reworking the timeline. The result? He didn't like. At all. Please like this video and subscribe to this channel. Tune in tomorrow for the next chapter. Thanks for listening.